Well, in 2009, you uh, made a joke during one of your stand-ups. You said, uh, I'm glad Hurricane Katrina happened. It taught us an important lesson. Black people can't swim. Right. Never said that, by the way. Oh, you never said that? No. no. Did you say something similar or no. is all this made up? No. The reason they got upset was I asked, is it smart to build a city 20 feet below sea level right next to the ocean? That was the question I asked people in New Orleans, right? That was legit the thing. Um, black people can't swim joke has been, I, I've done a version of that somewhere. I still do a version of that. Let me think about the most recent version of that. Ah, I do a joke about how the last three Winter Olympics, an African-American has won a medal for the United States of America in some form of speed skating on ice. By the way, that's an actual statistic. Mm -hmm. And then I say, we got to give it up to the black people. They were very scared at first. We had to tell them, no, oh, don't worry. You can't drown. The water's frozen. <laughs> and then I do, and whatever. So the, a version of that in some way, shape, or form, you know, has been a part of the act. Only because to date, it's down to 60 percent. But when I was doing stand-up in early career, it was 80, 75 to 80% of African-Americans couldn't swim. So it was just a statistic. But I would not, if my stand-up is never about being bombastic without reason, right? So I would never just say that. That's not, it doesn't say anything. It's just trying to be funny. It's it's just trying to say black people can't swim. I, it, it's too simple for me. It's, I would want complexity. Plus, by the way, if I'd ever said that, again, I record all my shows. Mm. So somebody would have put it out. Somebody would say, listen to it. This is where he said it. I never Let's said that. Way. Yeah, and listen, it is a long-running joke. I remember after the Montgomery brawl, sure. this, this guy made a song about it, and he said right. uh, one of the lines was, shout out to the first black man who swam to a fight. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so there it's, you kind, of, there it's you kind of the same joke. Exactly, exactly. In its own way, you correct, know what I'm saying? Correct, correct, correct. But I never said that, never said glad that Katrina hit, but that happened, this fucking comment happened after Bush got in trouble. And so some of the people were trying to kind of lump me in with the Bush hates black people thing, going back to Kanye, by the way. So it's when Kanye said Bush hates black people. Mm -hmm. So I, I was kind of stuck in the middle of that. But no, I never. But I but I was banned from performing in the city for a few years. <laughs> yeah, you got uh, kicked off the uh, the crew of Orpheus Celebrity lineup at yep. the Mardi Gras. Yep. I got so I couldn't go perform there. I couldn't do Laredo. Um, yeah, there was others, but I never said that, that I would never, it, it would, that, that thought would never enter my brain, even comedically. I'm glad that a hurricane hit because it taught us. My, I would actually tell the opposite and go, man, what kind of a God sends it to a place where it knows that people can swim? Kind of, you know, like I would make it more complex than that. Yeah. It wouldn't be that cheesy, simplistic. It's just not, it doesn't have my prints on it. Wall Street Journal did an article and it said that you, Dane Cook, and Jay Leno were the three of the most popular stand-ups that were hated by fellow comedians. Probably. I would say I'm, I would say just based on the algorithms, it's probably me. What, what is it about Dane Cook and Jay Leno that groups them in with you? Because I, you know, like I said, I'm not a stand-up I think that comedian, Jay Leno, so I, okay, so I think it's different. I think that Dane Cook and Jay Leno are getting what Taylor Swift is getting. Huh. Right, We're, meaning that they didn't do anything wrong. It's just their success, right? It's just their success. Yeah. It's, oh, Taylor Swift, like, what'd she do wrong? <laughs> I just don't like. Well, it's not <laughs> like, right? It's, it's know, the Jay same Leno thing was a beast. I mean, Correct. I mean, he's got more cars than anybody. So with them, it was just jealousy. They were the Nickelback of comedy. If you want to go there, I mean, okay. the Nickelback of comedy. What, what did Nickelback ever do? <laughs> Nothing. Right. Well, what did Taylor Swift ever do? Did good, made good music. Yeah. Right. I, on the other hand, I did run the light. I did bump these guys. I was, um, I wasn't sensitive to them. Now, looking back, I thought they, I thought they saw what I was saying as a joke. They did not. So now I can see their pain, and you know, whatever their pain is, is their pain. I, I remember a friend of mine said, "Do you remember when I got off stage after I got that standing ovation?" I said, yeah, it's the first annuation you ever got. It was pretty impressive. I'm fortunate to have ever seen that. He goes, do you remember what you said when I got off stage? 
I said, yeah. I looked at you and I said, you know, one day you're actually going to be pretty funny. <laughs> and he goes, that devastated me. And I said, wait, what? He goes, dude, you were my mentor. At that moment, all I wanted was to be acknowledged as that on that day, I was as good as you can be because you, even if you got a standing ovation, you can't do better than a standing ovation. And I was like, Jesus, bro. But by that time in my life, I had already done enough work, enough therapy, enough introspection, enough, you know, reading books and all that kind of stuff that I kind of just saw his pain. And I said, I'm sorry. And I thought as comedians, you would understand that I'm a mathematician. And what you said was correct. You got a standing ovation. Nothing I could have said at that moment in my mind could have taken it away. But somehow I was able to say something that took it away from you. And I'm sorry. I did that a lot, not on purpose, just kind of being funny and not knowing comedians off stage aren't the best human beings when it comes to sense of humor. Well, in 2020, Joe Rogan did an interview with Hollywood Reporter and they asked about the incident. He said, I don't have any hate for that dude. Have the two of you ever ran into each other, had a conversation, got on the phone, talked about doing his podcast, no, anything? But again, I've never said anything bad about the guy. You know, yeah. he he's he's only said bad things about me. So, you know, um, I have no idea where he's at with it. None, none whatsoever. Yeah, well, I guess when the incident happened, when he was on stage with you, I guess you guys had the same agents. And yes. what he said was the agents called him up and said, listen, you got to apologize or else we got to drop you. And he refused to apologize. So they dropped him. And then, you know, obviously that probably added to the. Well, when you I know, got a phone call from the agents, what I said was, hey, listen, guys, I'm not going to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. You just have two clients and one of them is trying to take money out of your pocket by taking it out of mine. Mm. That's all I can say. That's an actual. Which is fair. It's fair. That's just what it is. Yeah. Right. So he has he has a platform. I have a platform. Yeah, but you were way bigger than him back then. I don't believe that. No, I don't believe that. I think people forget how popular that show he was on is, was. Okay. Okay. Were you a bigger stand-up comedian at that point? Look at the, look at, look at the ratings for Fear Factor and look at the ratings for Mind and Sia. Now you got to remember, we're right, being judged. Mind and Sia was all you. Fear Factor, he was a host of a bigger entity. Yeah. But for every 1 million people that watch Mind and Sia, 10 million people watch okay. the Fear Factor. Fair enough. So if, he was way more popular than I was, right? The name Carlos Mencia was not as big as the name Joe Rogan even then. Okay. People forget. And, and before that, he was on a hit series on NBC. I think it's News Radio, if I'm not mistaken, the name of the show. Mm. Where, so, yeah. But so he, was, he did that. Then he was on Fear Factor. He, he was way more known than I was way more popular than I was. I, I was not. Well, I hope you guys at one point, big. you guys are grown men. <laughs> you have kids. I mean, at the end of the day, this sounds like a whole bunch of nothing. Honestly. It sounds it like a does whole bunch of nothing. It does in the way you say it. And I can, you know, I, I can accept the way you say it today. It's awesome. It's beautiful. It's cost me a lot. A lot. It's cost me friendships. It's cost me money. Well, you were in therapy it's for a while, over, right? Status. It's cost me stature. It's cost so much, so much. Because not only do people, not only do some people believe that I steal jokes, they they believe the narrative that I was sitting in the back of the room stealing everybody's stuff and just changing it. And adding the word Mexican to it and making mine. I mean, shit, that's not even plausible. Um, plus, I can't say who it is. But I'll tell you that a producer who has had two hit TV shows and one hit streaming show. So two networks, one streaming. Called me up not too long ago. Apologized. Said they wanted you to be on this thing that I was doing and I made sure that you weren't on it because I'm a fan of Rogan and after all the stuff that's happened recently 
I question now and now I see that, you know, the narrative for you wasn't it. And look, I'm just calling to say, I'm sorry. I don't have a g job for you. I don't have a gig for you. I just, I'm sorry that, you know, I took that away from you and I wish I could take it back because I don't, now I see you don't deserve it and blah, blah, blah. And I said, if you want absolution from me, you got it, man. It's yours to keep, but between us. Mm -hmm. Those are the moments that I'm glad it's me, man. Because I'm glad it's me. I'm glad that I don't have that little part of me that goes, man, it would be so easy to end it right now. Because as I sit here and think about it, it's all my work and therapy and all my introspection that allows me to kind of go, relax, dude, it's fine. It is what it is. But, you know, to to hear that and to know that that's, a, that's true, that's a real thing. And I was good enough to absolve him because, well, what am I going to tell him something negative so that he feels pain, so that he lives in that pain, so that he lives in that moment? I think what's happening right now is the worst thing for me because I'm a very nice human being and I didn't do that for you or for me or to be here right now or to sound better than or grandiose or to give myself anything. I literally said, what are you going to do? You're going to make this guy feel bad? He already feels bad. He's already calling you feeling bad. What am I going to give him more pain? No, I'll just accept it and move on. But that person, that's who all these people are shitting on. Somebody that when given the opportunity to, to give pain or take it, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'll, I'll, I'll put it in mind. Yeah, I mean, look, you, you're probably the first comedian to be hit by what we call cancel culture these days. Oh, no, and, I am. I'm and, the first and, person yeah, the internet ever tried to cancel. Yeah, and at the end of the day, the first people always get it the worst. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Like... Sure. I ask probing questions in my interviews so people start calling me the police. And that stuck with me for 15 years. Now all the new interviewers, they do the exact same thing that I do. It's considered normal. But I'm always going to have that stigma, and that's fine. It's okay. Right. I've been compensated well for my work. I get to do what I love. Right. And you get to do what you love. Right. You're still touring. Sure. You're still doing your thing. Yeah. So, yeah, people are going to hold certain things in your past against you, but you're still doing shows. You still have people that are paying to see you. So at the end of the day, who gives a fuck? Yeah, except when you go from selling, you know, 30,000 seats to selling 2,000 seats and then 2,000 seats to selling a comedy club out within a period of a year to a year and a half. That is a, that's, that's just a, it's a huge, huge, I mean, thank God I didn't do anything really stupid with my money, but it's, it's not, it's. It, from the outside looking in, it might seem like it's not a big deal, but it, it, it was a big deal. And it is a big deal to me to, to be looked at for what I do. But at the end of the day, and think about it, and taking all of this, I let this go. I let it go, I move on. Move on to the next thing. But let's talk about what I'm doing now. Let's talk about my, my stuff now. You know what I mean? That's where I got to go with this stuff because anything else is just getting, a, it's like a vortex of, darkness and negativity.